listening now for Andrew Lloyd Webber. You'll be able to phone him and not sing. Shut up. You'll be able to phone him and not sing on 01-811-8055. He is our press conference guest this morning, and I promise you won't have any more singing of Andrew Ooh. Lloyd Webber. <laughs> Philip! We're all taking it very seriously. Now... <laughs> cats don't write musicals. No, no, no. Cats is the name of the show. Oh, right. Oh, well, maybe you should write another show, you know, based on singing in the rain. Singing in the rain? Yeah, you could call it Cats and Dogs, you know. Yeah, yeah, Raining yeah, yeah, cats yeah, right. and dogs. Okay. Okay. Well, people in the know, they actually say that his best one is uh, Vita. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, maybe, but only, is, only when used as part of a... Please cabin. welcome today's press conference guest, Andrew Lloyd. Not Weber, but Weber. Yeah. <laughs> Masses and masses of questions, and we'll start with Kevin. Does the need for commercial success influence the way you write your musicals? Well, <coughs> I've always found that if you think about a commercial success, you never get one. Uh, the, the, the best thing to do is to write what you want. That's why I think sometimes people have said my subjects are rather strange, whether they're Cats or Ava Perron, or to write a Requiem Mass, or, to, or, or, or whatever. If you actually decide that what you're going to do is you want to do something to be a great commercial success, I just reckon it never is. You are a born pessimist, though, aren't you? People who I know that know you say, oh, always says it's going, to, it's going to be a huge flop, it's never going to work. And it seems well, it's like because always... you, there, are, there are no rules in, in musicals. You never know. And I've been very, very lucky that the things that I have written do seem to have had a, a popular success and people have liked them. But I never sit down and say, this morning, what I've got to do is to write um, something that I know is going to work, because I know that if you do that, you might as well forget it. A sure way to fail. Yeah. Now let's go to the phones, Andrew. Who's on line one? Hello? Who's that? Kaya. Hello. What's your question for Andrew? Um, what sort of music do you listen to when you're relaxing? Oh, myself? Well, I get um, not too much chance really to listen to a lot nowadays, but uh, I have to tell you, look, my favourite record at the moment is Mike and the Mechanics, so that gives you an idea of the kind of pop I like. Um, I'm very fond of a lot of serious music. Um, obviously, I um, last night watched the marvellous video that there is of Benjamin Britten's War Requiem. My tastes in music are very, very wide. I, I, I don't really have any one favourite composer, but I have lots of favourite pieces of music. Thanks a lot. Thank you for that. And Pauline has a question. Okay. Whereabouts is Pauline? She's right here. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> what are the main qualities you look for in a performer, for example, when they're auditioning for production? Well, the most important thing is, is that they are actually right for the particular part. Um, you know, ev every show has a you know, different uh, demand. Every performance every, obviously will have a different quality. Um, when you're looking for, for example, to cast the Phantom of the Opera, you have to have somebody who has great charisma as an actor who can break through the fact that, of course, he's masked for most of the show. And um, that, of course, means that you have to look for a, a unique performer who can also sing very strongly. Um, if you're looking, for example, for the role of Christine, uh, you have to have somebody who's very delicate, who has a, a high soprano voice, and uh, you know, you, each, each show has, and each part has its own particular requirement. Do you think we're very lucky in this country to have people with such broad skills of that nature? Well, we are and we aren't. Um, I mean, I, I think we've got some marvellous uh, actors and singers, and we've got some marvellous dancers. I have to say, though, that uh, when we were casting Aspects of Love, we found it really quite difficult to find people of the skills that we were, we were looking for. And I, I think perhaps what we have done is we perhaps slightly neglected the acting side, that the dance has come up now. We can really dance and sing as well, uh, as, as, as probably the Americans can. But we did find this time that we found that a lot more of the American performers were able to do the things that we needed for Aspects. All rounders. Well, yes, so there's the acting ability, really. Uh, that, I mean, it may be that specific show, and I think you can't generalise, but I think, it, uh, I think it's something that we've got to get onto, just to try and get the acting standards back up again. Let's go to the phones. Mm -hmm. Who's online two? Hello. Hello, who are you? Sarah. Hello, Sarah. If you could go to any one of your <coughs> musicals, which one would you go to? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, funnily enough, um, it depends on the night. <laughs> um, but I, I still enjoy The Phantom of the Opera very much because I think it's a wonderful coming together of the whole idea of the, of, of the piece and the sets and the music all, all seem to me to work. And also I have a other favourite, Novita. Um, unfortunately not on at the moment, so I can't go to it. Were there any that you thought, this is never ever going to be ready on time, it's not going to happen? Well, Cats. <laughs> Um, well, on, on the Good Friday that Cats was in preview, we, we um, all met together and decided to cancel it. <laughs> and that's quite true. We went to the only restaurant that was open, which was Joe Allen's in Covent Garden, 
and the producer, Cameron McIntosh, and myself met with Trevor Nunn, the director, and said, it's closing, we're, we're not going on with this, it's impossible. And Trevor said, um, no way, you're both crazy, go away for a couple of days and come back, and we came back and it was on. Thank goodness you did. <laughs> Thank heavens. Thanks for your call, Sarah. Trevor. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> and Bon. Question from Bon. Um, what do you think is most important in a show, the plot, the staging, or the music <coughs> itself? Well, for me, of course, the music. Um, I have a little system that I work out now, which, which is to try out all my shows in concert before they ever get any staging at all. I've done that with Vita and everything from then onwards. So I know that whatever happens to it in the theatre, at least I've got an idea of how the music's gone. And for me, I think the music's very, very important. But then it's the construction of a musical, because that's the most important thing as well. If you, if you know that your evening is going right, um, and you, you, you can lead an audience along that path, things will work. But it's, it's no good having a, a great song. For example, say you had some enchanted evening and you had the wrong place for it. Some enchanted evening probably would never be known today. How, close, how closely in touch do you stay with your musicals around the world? How closely can you stay in touch? Well, as much as I can, um, but I have to say that, I mean, if I actually now stayed in touch with all of them all the time, um, I think I'd just be permanently on an aeroplane and never have time to write at all. But, I mean, I see all of the openings of the main ones, and then there comes a time, you know, for example, I'm not going to be involved with cats in Argentina. <laughs> I mean... Never. <laughs> Let's go to the phones. Hello, who's on line three? Tanya. Hello, Tanya. What's your question? This summer I will be ten and my sister seven, and we would both like to see one of your shows. Which one would be most suitable, and could we still get tickets for July? We've already seen Joseph's Technicolor Dreamcoat. Well, I think you might enjoy Cats or Starlight Express. Um, both, I'm sure you can get tickets for in July. Um, where do you live? Heathfield. Ah, well then I think it's one of the London ones. Yes, either right, Cats so or Starlight. Which one would you prefer, Cats or Starlight? What do you think? Cats. <coughs> right, well, have a good time. Have a good time. Thank you, Tanya. And a question Fans. from Danny. How long did it take for you... To... How long did it take to get a musical on the stage after you finished writing it? <laughs> well, um, of course, in one sense, you haven't finished writing a musical until it's actually up there on the stage because things can work out very differently than what you thought. But I do try and uh, have everything as well as possibly organized before I go into rehearsal. I mean, it, the rehearsals for Aspects of Love, for example, my new one, they're quite long. Uh, we've got a long period. And it's about 12 weeks to actually do it. But the planning of all the other things goes on all through the, through the sort of the, the time we're working. It's, it takes about two and a half years from the day you begin to write a musical to the time you get in on stage, normally. Phones. Who's on line four? Hello. Hello, who are you? Ross. Ross, what's your question for Andrew? Hello, Andrew. Hello. I've been to see Phantom, Starlight and Cats, and I'm trying to get tickets for your latest musical aspects of love. But my question is, can you tell me which is the best way to get into acting when I leave school? I already study drama for GCSE. Well, uh, there are a number of ways. You can um, obviously audition for one of the drama schools themselves, um, or you could start to work in amateur dramatics and, and, and then go for what we call open auditions, which are the non-equity non auditions for um, musicals or for <coughs> the stage work. But I think probably you, do, you should talk to your teachers and ask them for their advice about what way they would suggest you go or try for one of the drama schools. Yep, or, or universities. You can study drama at university yes, of course as well, you can. Ross. Yeah. Um, there are lots of different things. Talk to your teachers about it. Thank you. Hey, nice to talk to you. Thank you for your call. And one from the floor from Alison. What has been your most expensive production to ever be staged? Most expensive production was Starlight Express. And that, that was very expensive. Was that because of the staging? Yes, it was. I, I, I still, myself, think that it may be a little bit overdone, but that's a private thing for me. Um, I mean, for example, Aspects of Love, we're, we're really trying to keep it keep it really down. We're not, not going for a huge, great production or great physical production, but it is terrifying how the cost of musicals are rising. I mean, it's just, uh, just since The Phantom of the Opera was done, which is three years ago now, everything has gone up again. All the hidden things have gone up by about 20%. Could you put a figure on how much the setting for Starlight Express Actually cost, cost in America, which is probably the best, best place to think about it, about $10 million. Good Lord. Which is a lot of money. 
And when you say you think it might be a little bit overstaged in your, for your, your own mind, but do, do you have then the ability to say, well, actually, there's too much on there? Well, Starlight's a, Starlight's a rather odd case because I wrote that as a completely different idea. I wrote it as a cartoon film about Cinderella. And it was going to be that it was the story of Cinderella about a, a steam train who would be Cinderella, and the diesel train was going to be the, uh, and the electric were going to be the ugly sisters. <laughs> and that was what it was. Um, and it got taken from a very small one hour idea for a cartoon, which it one day will be, actually, um, and, and turned into what it, what it was. I was always a little bit uncertain about it all the way along the line, I have to admit, but it, it is great fun. Uh, and, and, it, and one of the things it does do, of course, is it introduces a lot of people to the theatre who I think probably would not normally go, mm. and then they perhaps discover other things. Mm. I think we've got... Uh, Matthew has a... Oh, has fine, a, if that's yes, all right. yes, Matthew fine. has a, a question just to finish on Aspects of Love. Where what made it? you choose Roger Moore to appear in Aspects oh, of Love? Well, we had to find somebody with the kind of quality <coughs> of an, an actor like David Niven, who uh, was a wonderfully suave, urbane performer and um, who was also very witty and funny. And Roger is very like David Niven. He was a very great friend of David's. <coughs> and uh, that, I think, was one of the reasons that we, we cast him, because that's very much what we were looking for. All right, well, thank you very, very much indeed for, uh, for being our press conference guest. Masses of questions to get through. We're always caught by the clock, but, uh, the, but we've you. learned a lot. Thank well, you very thank much you. indeed. Thank Thanks. you, all enjoyed it. Well, we've got masses more for you next week on Going Live. Please be with us, because we're showing Heat One of The Young Everything. Bye-bye.